I'm Stephen Blackwood, and I have the great honor today to be here with Sir Roger Penrose and Dr. Jordan Peterson. Let's get right down to it. Jordan, I know you have questions you're keen to pose to Sir Roger. Over to you. Yeah, well, I've wanted to talk to a theoretical physicist for about 30 years, and so I'm pretty happy that you're the theoretical physicist that I get to talk to. I'm probably not representative, so you... <laughs> well, that might be even better. So I want to jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> a colleague and friend of mine is a AI engineer and a computer engineer, and he's built a lot of the world's great chips, uh, iPhone chip, and mm -hmm. first 64-bit chip, the Alpha, back in 1985. And we were having a conversation. I said I was coming to meet you and that you, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, believe me, but that you believe that consciousness is in some fundamental sense non-computational. And I asked him what he thought about that, and part of the reason I asked him is because he's, of all the people I've ever met, and maybe of all the people in the world, he's the person who's done most to build arguably brain-like algorithmic systems. And so I asked him if he thought that there was a distinction between the algorithmic computation of cognition per se, and whatever consciousness might be, and he thought it was algorithmic all the way down. And I understand that you don't believe that. I also went with him a couple of times to a consciousness conference in Tucson where Hameroff oh, yeah. spoke. Sure. So we, we got familiar with that line of reasoning. And I also understand, I believe, that part of the reason that you think that consciousness is necessarily non-computational is because of Goodell's theorem. And so maybe we could, we could enter there. So what it, I'm very curious about your proposition that consciousness per se is non-computational, and I'm curious about why you came to that conclusion, and if you think that's a warranted conclusion, what, what you think about that in relationship to these complex AI systems, and, and also in relationship to Goodell's theorem. Well, I've never seen the argument refuted. I've just talked to people who've, ne who've never really understood it, as far as I know. No, the argument goes back to when I was a graduate student, and I was doing pure mathematics, algebraic geometry, and I went to three courses, which were nothing to do with what I was supposed to be doing. One of them was a wonderful course by Herman Bondi on general relativity, which had a big influence on what I did later on. One was a talk by the great physicist Paul Dirac, and that taught me about quantum mechanics. And their third one was a course by a logician called Steen. And he taught me about Turing machines, the notion of computability, what it is and how you understand that, and the Gödel theorem. And I had heard vaguely about the Gödel theorem previously and had been rather worried because it seemed to show that there were things in mathematics that you couldn't prove. What I learned was that it's not like that at all. Well, it is like that in a sense. If you lay down the rules of what you call a proof, and if those rules are such that they could be checked by a computer, checked whether they've been correctly applied by a computer, so computational rules in that sense, then you can, you can construct a sentence, this is what Gödel did, which the, by the way it's constructed, you can see that if you trust the rules, that is to say, if you believe that the rules do, if they say, yes, you've proved it, tick, then you believe it's correct. That is to say, if you have trust in the rules, that trust extends beyond the rules. In other words, you can see that a certain statement is true by virtue of your belief that the rules only give you truths. Yet, that statement is underivable, unprovable using the rules. That, that statement of faith about the rules. It's not a statement of faith. I'm sorry, I didn't understand Oh, well, that. I, I, I... The faith is, it's not a faith. You understand the rules, you check them, you say, yes, that's okay. If that rule is correctly applied, I agree, it does, you know, it's a, lot, it's a, it, it, it's a, a rule which is within something that you believe to be appropriate. Yeah. And, and these rules, it's built up out of things like this, which you, nobody would dispute. You say, okay, if you follow those rules, and it says, yes, that's a proof, then you believe it, that the thing that it says, yes, it's a proof, is actually a true statement. So does a proof really mean that it's true? If you believe that, that 
that conviction that the proofs actually do what they're supposed to do gives you something beyond the, the rules themselves. Okay, that, that's, sorry, that's what I was referring to with, this, yes. with the word faith, is that the statement not, of belief... Not, no, well, faith I shouldn't is, maybe is, I use think, that wrong, word. Wrong word. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I guess I'm okay, wondering, yes. what, what do you think it is that, cons, that com, constitutes that belief? It's, uh, okay, and, and why the word understanding specifically? Because that's the thing in some sense that's outside the system. The understanding? Yes, it is. Because you can see it is. Because... It's the understanding that the rules give you only truths that enables you to understand that this girdle statement is actually true. And so, the, is that belief in that truth of that proof, that is one of the things that Girdell pointed out would be necessarily outside any system that's both, what is it, formal, logical, and coherent? It shows, it shows that the... the I mean, I, I read it in this particular way. I don't think he said it quite like this. But I read it in the following way, that understanding, whatever that word means, is not computational. Okay, okay. It's okay. Not, so that, that is what it's I... not the following of rules. It's something else. Okay, so let, let me ask you a question about that. So, this is a three-pronged question, let's <laughs> okay, say. Okay, yes. It seems to me that there's a high probability that the future is actually indeterminately different than the present and the past, that it's actually unpredictably different. Oh, this is a different question. Yeah, now, you're, it, it, now you're talking about determinism. Yes, yes, yes. But, uh, but I think it's, I, it seems to me that it's tied to this idea that computation can be complete and algorithmic. I don't think it can be because if the future differs in a, in a fundamental manner, an unpredictable manner from the present or the past, then a deterministic algorithmic system can't maintain a grip on the horizon of the future. And, and, and I have another part of that question. Mm, but it's a different question. So I think, we, I think it's important to distinguish these things. Yes. Because up to this point, I was not talking about indeterminism. No, no, no. I, I was talking about rules, well, just yes or no. And, and I mean, it's not a question of maybe <laughs> or... I mean, it isn't even talking about the laws of physics at this stage. That's mm -hmm. the second step, mm -hmm. if you like. I was, I guess I leapt yes. forward to something like the, the potential f necessary function of consciousness. So, because one of the things consciousness seems to do from a neurophysiological perspective, for example, we tend to become conscious of our procedural errors. And so consciousness becomes alerted to the errors and then zeroes in on the source of the error in some sense and corrects it. And so it looks to me like it's something like a correction system for, el for underlying algorithmic systems. So, for example, if you practice a, a motor routine for a long time, you build specialized algorithmic machinery in your brain that runs it. But maybe you, you put in an error, you're playing a difficult piano phrase, for example, and you stumble over a note. You've automatized that. You play it, you listen, and you hear the anomaly, which is the error. Your consciousness focus isn't on that. A large brain area will activate as a consequence of becoming aware of that error. Then when you practice the new routine that's corrected, the brain area will shrink and shrink and shrink until it's a small part of the brain, usually in the back of the left hemisphere. And now you've built another automated machine to, to play out that phrase. And consciousness, I think it was Whitehead who said that, uh, that at least the, the purpose of consciousness, although he might have used thought, was to increase the number of things that we can do without consciousness or thought. But it seems to be this horizon phenomena. And, and the reason I was asking about the indeterminacy of the future was twofold, is that if the future is deterministic, then an algorithmic system could, in principle, adapt to it. But I don't, it doesn't seem to me that the future can be predictable, and I think that that might be grounded in something like quantum indeterminacy, because there isn't a fundamental determinism that propagates all the way up. So, Well, you see, uh, I mean, we have to... The things I was talking about up to this point were not to do... They weren't even to do with the laws of physics, so that's a separate question. I mean, it did relate to that, which is my own views certainly did depend on that. But... Um, the question of determinism is a separate issue. And the normal way we look at quantum mechanics is it does involve an indeterminism, um, which you can have a theory which does that too. But that's different, you see. If, if it's just indeterministic, 
it um, it's not it's not connected. But you see, the, the the girdle argument is to do with things where you have definite rules. You you can check whether these rules have been followed or not. And the question is whether it co- coincides with your understanding about what things are true or false in mathematics. Mm-hmm. So that's what it's to do with. <clears throat> now you see, you can question how you, you move from that into other aspects of what consciousness does. And also mm-hmm. the question you were, you were referring to is whether something's automatic and your pianist can play things and obviously where the little finger goes next is not something that he or she decides to do. It's all largely controlled by the cerebellum probably which as far as we know is entirely unconscious. So the greater number of neurons in the brain, which are in the cerebellum, seem not to be acting according to conscious actions at all. It's something completely unconscious. Right. Well, yes, we the, that's a very strange thing that you know people make the case as well that there's some simple relationship between neuronal function and consciousness, but as you pointed out, the cerebellum does the cerebellar activity doesn't seem to be conscious at all, and then yeah. you're, there's a tremendous amount of neurons in your autonomic nervous system distributed throughout your body, and there there may be some consciousness associated with that, but it's not particularly acute, and most of the time it's entirely unconscious. And the autonomic nervous system is running your digestive system and your heart and all of these inner automated systems, and it's interesting too because often becoming consciously aware of a highly functional unconscious system actually impairs its function rather than improving it. That could be, yeah, sure. That's, I'm not sure, quite sure what this tells us about consciousness. It just tells us certain things are not conscious, which are controlled by neurons in the brain, and, and so it's a different issue. Right. May I, may I just jump in to ask, yeah. Sir Roger, if you would say a, a word or two more about uh, why it is that consciousness cannot be reduced simply to mechanistic uh, processes. Well, you see, I'm, I'm very careful to say I'm not talking about consciousness in all its aspects. Yes. For example, I mean, I have nothing to say about the perception of the color green, for instance. I mean, sure, there's something going on which makes green have a certain impression on one. But this is not what I'm talking about. And probably most of the things that we think about when we talk about consciousness are not what I'm talking about. So I'm only talking about a very specific part of what consciousness does and the argument is that if it, if this is something which is not a com- computational process then it sort of sheds a question mark on the whole thing but it's only very specific to the question of understanding so I tend to make that point clear and understanding is something which in the, certainly in the normal usage of the word implies conscious I mean, you wouldn't say of a device normally that it understands something without it being aware of something. And aware means being conscious of it. So that's just normal usage, and I'm going along with that. So I don't know what most of these words mean, but I would say that understanding is something which requires consciousness. Yes, there's one way into this. To speak about, I mean, so much of our thinking, of course, is calculative. There's a, there's a goal there. We're calculating how to get to it. Um, and yeah. so there's a huge amount of life that is, that is, that is like that. But yeah. to then ask the question about why this is a goal or why this is worthy of being a goal or what would make it worthy of being a goal or what would make that worthy of being a justification for that to be a goal, the kinds of thinking that you have to engage in in order to reflect upon the nature of the ends and purposes is distinct from the kinds of thinking you engage in to calculate your way to a goal. And that seems to point towards the the realm or a kind of thinking or awareness that is clearly distinct from a re- simply mechanistic uh, calculation. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. It's just it's hard to know whether those things could be put into a computational system. Mm -hmm. The reason for concentrating on this very specific area is that I can say something about it, that's all. So the particular area is is, um, mathematical proof. I see most people don't bother themselves with mathematical proof, and they're conscious too, so I'm certainly not saying that's a... 
indicator of consciousness. I mean, I'm saying it is something which requires consciousness, but I am completely accept that there are all sorts of other aspects of consciousness which are going on all the time and which are much more important. I've gone along with that too. But it's just that if you can find something in what consciousness seems to do, which is not, which is demonstrably not computational, that's saying something. And that's the limited little thing I'm trying to say. Now, you, you started working with Hameroff, as I understand it, mm. to try to provide something approximating a localization or a neuro neurophysiological account of what this non-deterministic process might be. And ah, but I didn't say that's usually non-deterministic. That's different. Okay. See, non it's very easy to confuse the two. Well, and I am confused <laughs> about them, apparently. Now, you see, non-deterministic means that rules don't have a clear statement about what happens next. And maybe there is a choice about what happens next. And that choice might be random. Maybe, or maybe choice in some more personal sense that you have a reason. I don't know. But usually one talks about randomness there. You say that the, the theory does not have a complete description of what it tells you happens in the future because there is an, a random element in it. And the way quantum in the mechanics... Future, random element yes, in the future. Yes, in the future. That's what normally, the way in which one talks about quantum mechanics normally. I mean, I have... Right. And that's a truly random feature. In, in, in so current, it's not predictable. In current quantum mechanics, that's correct, yes. Okay, so that's what I was referring to when I was yes. referring to the... In, like the indeterminacy of the future horizon. It was, sorry, it was that randomness that I was trying yes, to well, point Yes, well, you see... To. I mean, but this is another question. You can have a random device which is otherwise computational. I mean, it just you put in at certain points, okay, do something randomly. The thing is, I don't think, I, an interesting question there, I don't think that gives you anything in the way of establishing results which, which seem to be a non-computational process, like with the girdle thing. Okay, so... so Okay, so there's an evolutionary answer to the problem of emergent randomness. And the answer is, so a mosquito, a mosquito is a good example. Yeah. Any, or a fish, any animal that lays a tremendous number of eggs that could conceivably march to maturity. So there's genetic mutation in all, so maybe let's say, just for the sake of argument, that a given mosquito lays a million eggs, fertile eggs, in its lifetime. Yeah. Now, there's variation in those mosquito patterns, and at least a certain amount of that variation is random. That's a consequence, and it's, it's actually a consequence, I would say, of events that are actually manifesting themselves in some sense at a quantum level, because at least some of the mutations are caused by solar, by radiation, and so there's disruption at a molecular level, and so evolution seems to be able to use the admixture of randomness into structure as a means of dealing with the determinacy of the future. And to some degree, it does that through death, right? Because yeah, yeah. of those million mosquitoes, on average, only one manages to propagate itself to reproduction, or we'd be knee-deep in mosquitoes and like... No, I understand what you're saying, yes. But what I'm trying to say is that what's going on with consciousness is different from that. Because I don't see how this, you know, you're putting randomness and in the way you're suggesting, and clearly that is, is an important aspect to evolution and so on. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't deny that mm -hmm. at all. But it's not the same thing. So that the see, consciousness I, isn't producing randomness in response to indeterminacy. Yes. It's, 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 when I say non-computational, I don't mean that it's random at certain times. I mean something quite different. So what, okay, let's, let's zero in on that. So, well, <laughs> yes. well, because I'm very curious about what you do mean. I mean, this is obviously a tremendously important distinction between hmm. algorithmic computa the computational algorithmic domain and something that's in some sense outside of it. And, and I'm struggling to understand at the most detailed level, let's say, what, how you, how you envision the the structure and function of consciousness, or maybe just the function. It's not producing mere random variance, and I, I, that can't be because random is too widespread. So at least, at the very least, so for example, if you study creative people, we've done a lot of this, there's in some sense more randomness in their 
speech. Because imagine that with, if you utter a given word, there's a certain probability that another word will emerge in the, in the field around that. The creative people use lower probability concepts and words in their approach. So there's a kind of randomness. They, they go farther out into the word association field. And that does help them generate more creative solutions. But that's not, if that becomes unconstrained to too great a degree, you get, well, maybe like a manic creativity that's, that's counterproductive and, and too random. People are jumping too much from disconnected point to disconnected point. And so, so consciousness doesn't seem to be, creative consciousness doesn't seem to be a mere random walk. So that's a psychological take on that. But so what do you think is what do you think? I'm still struggling to understand what you think consciousness does. It, it does understand. Yes. Uh, you see, I think probably you're trying to make me be more specific than I can be, because I don't mm. know what, what what it is that how to make a, a device that can understand something. So I'm just trying to say that whatever understanding is. It's not a computational process, and that's the argument. I'm okay, making. okay, I see. No, it's, it's not. I see. So I'm you're not, not trying to specify what it might be. You're just saying it has to be something that's non-computational. Yes, yes, that's right. And, yes. Okay. Is there a, okay. Is there a fundamental link? I mean, when we say non it's not. It is not non-computational. Does that mean, or does that not mean, by definition, that consciousness, in some deep level, is free? No, you see, does not. that's right. I'm not saying, I mean, th these are open questions. I'm yes. not saying that. I mean, it may be there is an aspect of, of indeterminism in it, and that could be. Um, but that's not what I'm saying. And it's, the trouble is, I think it's not a concept which people appreciate usually. So I can give you examples of non computational things. And the, the, one mm. of the examples I often give is if you take, you take a Imagine a, a, a pattern of squares, equal squares, or just a normal s square array. And you can consider a finite shape made out of squares. <clears throat> I think it's called a polyomino, a shape made out of squares. And you, if you're given a finite set of these po polyominoes, and the question is, can you cover the plane with those shapes, only those shapes, no gaps, no overlaps? Now that question, the answer, yes or no. The answer is definite, yes or no. Either you can or you can't. But it's not an algorithmic process. <clears throat> it's, it's shown mathematically that there is no algorithm which can tell you, yes or no, whether these shapes will cover the plane. Hmm. Okay, so when I was talking to my brother-in-law, yes. I was talking to him about these AI systems yes. that learn how to recognize, let's say, cats from photographs. He told me there is no way of algorithmically determining the program that the machine learning systems will eventually apply to the problem of identifying cats in a photograph. But if you let the AI neural networks run and then you analyze their output, you often get something that resembles an algorithmic program as an output that you could have hypothetically calculated if you could have specified the search space. It's something like that, but there's no way of there's no way of doing that without letting the program do its walk through the domain of cat photographs with its differentially weighted neural network architecture. Mm. You can't a priori predict it. Yeah, well, I still don't think it's the same thing. Um, I mean, I could certainly give it different shapes, and you can say, tell the machine, you know, which of these will tell the player and which won't. Now, will that learn to give you correct answers? Well, Probably, I, usually it does. I suppose once it's tiled, you could formalize the process by which it was tiled, right? Because you could, you could, you could, you could describe the, the, the mechanisms or the order in which the tiles were located and the rotation of them. You could specify it after it had all been laid down. And yeah. I think that's analogous to what the AI systems seem to be doing when they're learning to perceive. But the trouble is that it's not... The methods whereby you can tile the plane are... I mean, just the theorems tell you that they, you can't put... 
you can't put them on the computer. I mean, you might get the thing which works most of the time. Right. It's quite possible. Well, that, so in those tiling problems that you're describing. Yeah. And so that's, that is, I see, I guess I, I kind of see why you're interested in the tiling issue. So that has to do in some sense with the ability to, to map a surface with a certain representational form. And so if you have these tiles that you described and you're trying to, to completely cover a given surface, that's a mapping problem. I see what you're doing with that. Are there different ways that you could conceivably solve that problem? So yes, you saw, yeah. okay, so, yeah. so even if you do converge on a solution, you haven't converged on the only solution. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was an, an earlier result which showed that if it were true, that any way of tiling that plane with these shapes, with say some given set of shapes, finite set of shapes, if it tiles the plane, it can do it, you can do it periodically with a repeating pattern. If that were true, then there would be an algorithm. But it's not true, because there are certain ways of tiling a plane which do not have a repeating have, pattern. Have repeating patterns. And oh, the ones oh. That's so now, that's method. so cool, because I was wondering today, yes. I was wondering, why yes. in the world is he obsessed with tiles? What's going on? But, <laughs> well, the fact that, you're, that the tiles are, they're essentially, you're essentially mapping uh, an, an, an area with a, with a predetermined concept in some sense. That's the, that's the tile if shape. Like. Yeah, well, and, and you said it, it can be non-repeating and still solve the well, problem. Well, you see the one in front of the mass building. That's mm -hmm. an example. That's an example of a tile set, only two different shapes there. I mean, these aren't polyominoes, but never mind about that. Those two shapes will tile right out to infinity. But there is no way of doing this which is periodic. And you can see, it's almost, you can see this so, sort of repeat So how itself. do people actually do it then? Like, because there's another the, way of telling you how to do it. <laughs> with, 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 the, with the tiling, so do you, so you design the tiling in front of the building, so do you actually tell the workman how to start the tile, and then how do they figure out how to do it? Or they do had you, a plan for the whole thing. And you, you devised the plan for the whole thing? Yes. So you provided the map? Yes. Okay. How in the world did you get interested? Do you have any idea how you initially got interested in the tiling problem? Yes. Well, you see, it was, certainly was this computability question. That is the connection, yeah. I had mm -hmm. learnt, I think I'd seen an article in the maths, maths reviews, this is, reviews mathematical papers and so on, and I'd seen that there, somebody had produced a set of tiles which would tile the plane only, only non, in a non-periodic way. And I hadn't seen what they were like. And there was a conversation. I, I think it was just, just after I'd, I'd been appointed to my chair here, the rice ball chair, but before I'd taken it up. And I had a conversation with, with an American mathematician. Um, and he had told me in detail about, I think Ra there's a mathematician called Raphael Robinson who had got the number down to six, and he'd got a set of six tiles, which could only tile the plane in a non-repeating way. And he said that Raphael Robinson, this was Simon Cochin, who's an American mathematician, and he said that Raphael Robinson was somebody who liked to get the number to the smallest number, he was sort of perfectionist in this way. And he said he's got this run. He started, it started out with several thousand, you see, and he got it down to <laughs> six. And he's pretty pleased with that. And I said, well, I can do it with five. <laughs> I happen to know. I had a set with six, you see, but I knew that I could reduce it to five. How, how did you know? How did I know that? that did you set, could reduce it to five? Because the way that the, the I mean, it's just a technical point, there was a certain shape for matching. And this shape only fitted into one other tile, so that I could glue the the, the ones with. It's just a slight detail point. I could glue some of the tiles together to make them five. That's, and when you're that's when you're mapping the the plane, yeah, do you map it to the precise borders of the plane, or can there be overlap? It, do, you know what I mean? Can, can it be messy on the edges, or or are you trying to precisely cover, let's say, a rectangle? It keeps on going beyond the edge, and then you cut cut it along the edge. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. That's okay, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now you also had some interaction interactions, at least at arm's length, with with Escher. Oh yeah. 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 So what I read was that you and you and your father had been interested in Escher's work, and you worked out with him the ever ascending staircase. 
which by the way yeah. is, seems to me quite similar, especially to the music in Bach's third Brandenburg Concerto, which, and I talked to a musician this week about how Bach managed to make this continual ascending spiral that yes, never there, really there goes is, up. That's true, there is a thing like that. Yeah, yeah, right, yes. So, and then uh, you sent the drawings of the staircase to Escher. Well, the story was a little bit longer than that because I, I had been at this, I was a graduate student, I think in my second year, I can't quite remember. And I and a colleague went to Amsterdam to go to the International Congress of Mathematicians, which happened every four years. And at this Congress, I happened to see one of my lecturers and he had a catalogue which had one of these Escher pictures on mm. it. And what on earth is that, you see? And he said, well, this exhibition in the Van Gogh Museum by this artist, M.C. Escher, never heard of him before. I went to see the exhibition. I was absolutely blown over by these pictures. One in particular, I think, was called Relativity. And I came away thinking, gosh, that's amazing. I wonder whether I could do something a little bit different that I hadn't actually seen in, in the exhibition. And there, so I tried to make a construction with bridges and roads going in possible ways. And I simplified it down to this thing that people refer to as a tri-bar. Mm -hmm. I've seen the tri-bar. And uh, I showed my father. I mean, I didn't know that there's this uh, Swedish uh, artist called Oskar Reitersvard who had done things very similar earlier. Mm -hmm. but, but I actually didn't know about him either. But anyway, um, and there are other artists who've done things like, if you look carefully in, in the old Zabroigel, which, which has a... A picture of gallows and it's joined up differently in the top. From yes, the I've seen that. I've seen that picture. Yeah. So there are other people who had played with these ideas, but I hadn't quite seen it in Escher. And so my father and I wrote an article. He, he, he developed this. The staircase was his, actually. Mm -hmm. He was designing buildings and then he produced the staircase, which went round and round. And we decided to write a paper on this. We had no idea what the subject was, what journal did we send it to. So my father said, well, I happen to know the editor of the British Journal of Psychology, so let's call it Psychology. <laughs> so we sent it to them, and they accepted it. He said he thought he could get the <laughs> editor to accept it. They did, and this was, we gave reference to Escher's, the catalogue, and uh, to Escher's exhibition. And then my father had a, con uh, a correspondence with Escher, with letters going backwards and forwards. And then I think I was in, driving in the Netherlands for some other, I was a conference, I think. And I was curious. And I, when I was reasonably close to Escher, I phoned him up. I got the phone number from my father. And he was very nice. And he invited me and my then wife to, uh, to tea. And, uh, and he, I just had a chat with him. And he, he sat at one end of a long table. I was the other end. And he had two piles of prints. And he said, well, this pile, I don't have many left, I'm afraid. And he pushed the other pile to me. Choose one. <laughs> so I sort of went through these things. And I picked one out. Pretty hard to choose one out of all that. And I chose one called Fish and Scales, which mm -hmm. he was actually rather pleased because he said, well, most people don't understand that one. <laughs> so I felt a bit flattered by that. But this, I then gave him a set of little pieces of just one shape. And I, I gave him a set of them and said, well, can you tile with those? And then a little while later, he wrote to me and said he'd seen how to do it, but he wanted to know what the underlying principle was. So I did. I went afraid I was a very bad correspondent. It took me a little while before I got back to him. But I showed him the... the what it was based on. And on the, the basis of that, he produced what I believe was his last watercolor, maybe even his last picture as far as I know, a thing called Ghosts, which is based on, on this. Uh, it's the only tiling, as far as I know, that he ever did, which is what's called non-isohedral. You see, you, usually he did periodic ones, but they're periodic in the strong sense that if you find a shape the next time you see it, it has the same relation to the pattern as a whole. So you could move this one into that shape and the whole pattern goes with it into itself. But the one I showed him was what's called non-isohedral, that you can have different instances of the shape. So this one has a different relation to the pattern as a whole from that one. And so you, if I move this one into that, I can't bring the whole pattern along with it. 
So you have two different roles that the shape plays. And the last one of his pictures showed this. Hmm. So I'm, I'm curious too, so this, about, about two things now, I'm interested in why you're so fascinated by the relationship of a geometric shape that can be arrayed in a variety of different manners to this underlying problem of mapping. I be, so you're reducing, you're reducing or establishing a relationship between the problem of mapping a large terrain to the utilization of like very stringently defined, what would you call them? The representational systems or the, that's a geometric form. What, what is the geometric form conceptually? in relationship to the problem of mapping. Well, you had a shape and then you have certain rules about which fit pieces will fit next to it. But there's certain freedom in that rule. You could put this one that way or another way, you see. And, you know, if it's a, if it's a shape which very clearly has to fit that way next to it, then it just repeats. You <clears> see. <throat> but if there's some freedom as to what the next one will do, then you might have to make that choice and certain choices will run you into difficulties later, and other choices maybe will allow you to continue. Is there a relationship that between that and what composers do with music? Because I mean, there's a certain <laughs> no. well, there's a certain yes. repeating determinacy in music, but obviously a composer just doesn't take a pattern mm, and repeat mm -hmm. it indefinitely. They take a pattern, and the pattern seems to allow for some choice in mm. movement yeah. from that right. pattern forward. Well, maybe I don't know. I mean, it's. it's I mean, what makes a piece of music into a good piece of music? I mean, I have no idea. That's a, that's a much deeper issue. Well, we do know we, we do know. know a bit about it. We know that if it's too simple and repetitive, mm -hmm. it, you your you interest get gets exhausted. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, it gets yes. stale very rapidly, sure. and then mm -hmm. as it moves towards purely unpredictable, it becomes indistinguishable from noise. So there's some place in between there, and you could probably move on that place yeah. where you get some ultimately harmonious relationship of predictable form and, well, something like the play of novelty that seems to me to be analogous to that possibility of shifting the shapes in this tiling problem. I mean, I think music is tiling something. Yeah. It's a representational form. Okay. No, there's probably some connection. It's just that music, I mean, there's so much more freedom as to what you do. You, you see, with, this, with these tiling shapes, it's forced on you that you know, either it fits or it doesn't, you see. With, right, with music, right. it's much more subtle. Right. So I would. Right. I would hate to make too much of a comparison. A leap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, one more question along that okay. line. Yeah. Now that that triangle you made. Yes. Now, what's the relationship between those paradoxical forms and the tiling problem? Not much. <laughs> because they seem to be. They. There. I mean, there's a play of of representation and image there. I mean, one of the things I've been wondering. I looked at all your diverse contributions, and I thought wow, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of different places, but there must be some, there's something that's not random. <laughs> there's something at work that's a kind of a uniting principle that might be, I don't know, it might be the problem that you're trying to solve in some, in, in some deepest way that's uniting all these elements of exploration and interest. I don't know, you're asking too hard a question. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. sometimes, there, I don't see any overriding principle. I mean, there's a sort of thing, you know, something feels right. Now, why, do, why does it right. feel right? I mean, that could be something very subtle. Yeah. No, it may be wrong, too. Oh, well, maybe, See, maybe they that, are wrong. That, yes, yes. So but you, so it seems to, to me that that also is related in some important sense, psychologically, to that notion of understanding. You know, the feeling that it's right. It's, it's like it's interesting that it can be wrong, but it's also interesting that it can be a predictor of, like I had a student, a student, she was very creative, and she would come up with hypotheses that were damn good, mm -hmm. but she was more creative than the typical psychologist, and I don't say that in a denigrating way, I mean, she was more like an artist than a researcher. And then what she would do is spend like six months writing out the algorithmic pathway to that conclusion, even though that is not how she derived it. But she had a pretty unerring ability to jump forward to the right place with her intuition. And it's something like, I think it's something like a deep form of pattern recognition. You know, you don't need 
the full pattern to infer what the pattern might be. You can have a sparse representation of it leap to what might be analogous to a tiling solution, I suppose. And that, that seems to be something related to the accuracy of intuition. I know when people become schizotypal, for example, they're, they, and paranoid, that also happens in paranoia, they have a lot of intuitions about patterns that might be there, but most of them are wrong. And it's, so it's like their pattern recognition system has become, well, it's, it's exceeded the limits of its capacity for accuracy and is starting to see pattern in, in what's truly random. Yeah, prediction error. Yeah, well. May I ask, uh, there's a, uh, I think one important distinction here from what I can understand, Sir, Sir Roger, is, is uh, you know, what the nature of understanding is here is not, is not to be simply reduced to belief or, 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 or intuition, though it may be related to them. When one understands something, let's say, that's the simple equation that 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's not a belief that that is true. It, it, understanding is operating at a level that is beyond belief. It has a certainty, an inner certainty that is not subject to doubt fundamentally. Um, and what I was wondering if, if it might be helpful, just for the sake also of the people who may subsequently watch this conversation, if you would be willing, Sir Roger, to, to give us a, a sense of your, your uh, the, the way you describe the three spheres of, of, of matter and oh, mind understand. and yeah. mathematics, uh, as that might give us a basis for some quite rich conversation subsequently. Well, maybe. Uh, you want me to describe the, the picture? I mean, I, I, please. Well, this was just a way of thinking about the relationship between mathematics and the physical world and the world of conscious perception and I was regarding each of each of these as a sort of world I mean whether that's a useful way or not it was just helpful to me and there is the mathematical world and I take a very platonic view here that the mathematical world exists independently of us and so when we find a mathematical result it's it's more like a discovery than, than an invention so you it's there already and you find it so this is certainly a feeling that, as far as I'm aware, most mathematicians have. And the truths are there, and they're there independently of us. And if we're lucky, we can find one of these truths and, and, and see why it is a truth. Now, that's one thing. Now then there's the physical world. And the physical world, the more we learn about it, the more we find that it operates according to very precise mathematical laws. But yet it's very small. You see, if you look at a mathematical journal, you find it's almost entirely full of things which have nothing whatsoever to do with the physical world. They're playing around with mathematics for its own sake. That part of the mathematical world, which actually does have direct relevance to the way that the physical world operates, is a small part of it. So I have a picture of this mathematical world, and a tiny bit of that comes and imposes itself, or whatever you like to explain, or whatever you like to say, the physical world. So the more we learn about the physical world, the more we see it is driven, or acts according to these very specific, tiny part of the mathematical world. And the second thing is, in that physical world, which seems to be operating according to mathematics, there are entities which seem to be able to perceive and understand and have consciousness. So the, the acquisition of consciousness in whatever way is a small part. You see the world consists of rocks and things like that, which don't seem to have any of this quality. But there are certain creatures, <laughs> things, such as people in this room and elsewhere and probably other animals, which may have less of it than humans, but on the other hand, I'd certainly think they have consciousness, in some of them. So, but still, it's a tiny part of the physical world which seems to have access, or whatever the right thing is, seems to be able to be, in a certain sense, this world of consciousness. So it's just, again a small part of that. But it's only a tiny world, part of the conscious activity which is concerned with mathematics. 
So I had this picture which is sort of meant to be slightly paradoxical, that each world, in a certain sense, comes from a little bit, bit of the world preceding it. And so it's drawn in a way which is like, like this impossible triangle, which is a, a, looks like a paradox. That's only a little joke in a way. I, I don't know how, how much depth there is to that. Um, and I, I rather like to depict it in that way. So this, 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 so stop me when I'm wrong, okay? <laughs> well, anyway. All right, so yeah. it seems to me that the mathematical reality is something like the observation of the pattern regularity between things. It's not the things themselves. Oh, the, the physical, which, which, which well, way? Well, I'm thinking about yeah. the mathematical re oh, representation the, of the physical world. So, oh. because oh. things, there are things, obviously, but there are things in relationship to one another. Yeah. And the relationships between the things, like the pattern that your tiles yeah. mm -hmm. compose is just as real as the tiles. Well, right? the... But it consists of the relationship <laughs> between the tiles. And is it the representation of the relationship between things that's part of that mathematical world, rather than... I know it could be patterns well, the all the way down in is, some is, sense. You see, that it's a physical thing. You know, it's just sitting in front of the mass building. So that's, that's a physical thing. But it, is represent, it represents a mathematical idea, which only is, gives you the idea. You could say, oh, these tiles fit together in such and such a way, and these are parts of a Euclidean plane, and the Euclidean plane is a con concept. We don't actually have it physically. But you can see, by looking at the tiles carefully enough and see how they fit together, that this is a, a mathematical thing you're looking at, in a way. And that this mathematical thing would allow you to continue, if you understand what's mm -hmm. going on, indefinitely. So the entire Euclidean plane could be covered according to the rules of those shapes you see. Okay, so, so let, let me yeah. ask you another question <laughs> okay. about that then. So, is the physical world one tiling solution to the plane of mathematical possibility? I guess, it, in a sense. I mean, it's, it's slightly... You see, it's not really talking about the laws of physics there. You, it's only in the sense that Euclidean geometry is a pretty good approximation. That's all it's saying. I mean, there's not much physics going on there. You might say, well, what, what makes these tiles, some of them shine and some not shine or something like that. I mean, it's more like physics. But the actual design that's being used there, it's, it's been put there by human beings according to what another human being said they should, <laughs> where they should lay them down. And that was driven by a certain mathematical concept. But it's different from the way that mathematics underlies the laws of physics. And that's quite different. It might be if you took one of those tiles and threw it across, or it would be pretty hard to do because they're quite heavy. But the way that would move in the air before it came down and crashed, that would be a clear indication of a physical law way in which gravitation behaves. And then the way the thing holds together, the law that holds the, makes these tiles solid, would be something to do with the, um, well, quantum mechanics, to do with the ways that the atoms are constructed and how they connect with other atoms and what makes them solid rather than a fluid, or something like that. So that would be the way that mathematics drives the physics. It's, it's, it's general laws rather than a specific thing. I think that's, well, that's, I'm, I'm that's what I'm curious to say. Though, though yeah. it, because in, in some sense, and I could obviously be wrong about this, but the physical reality seems to constrain the mathematical possibility because there's only some mathematical rules that govern the behavior of actual objects, even though there's all sorts of possible mathematics that could govern the, the action of all sorts of hypothetical objects. Right. So, so it's so imagine if there's an underlying. I can't help but think that this is associated with this many worlds idea. But if there's an underlying metaverse of mathematical possibility, you get the emergence of something like well, a, a what would you say, one concretized exploration of that possibility space, mm -hmm. and that now establishes a relationship between 
one element of that mathematical possibility space and and well in reality itself doesn't exhaust the search space but it's and it seems to me that that's analogous to this tiling problem in some sense i think it's, it's uh, i don't know i can't help saying i think it's really very different from what one is trying to do in mathematical physics see in mathematical physics you're looking for general laws which seem individual in instances of it agree with those laws so mm. that an object like one of the tiles that are being used outside mass building um i mean the trouble is that it depends on detailed laws about the atoms which construct the tiles and so which has nothing to do with what we're talking about here i don't think it is <laughs> well i guess i was wondering partly because there's these fine tuning arguments you know and, and the question yeah. arises well there's lots of ways these phenomenon, phenomena could be interrelated, but in reality it turns out that there's a very finite and constrained number of ways that they are actually related, and those, those are the fundamental laws. And then the question arises, well, why that set of constraints and not you know, some other set of constraints that seems equally probably, probable statistically, you know, if it was a sample of the mathematical domain? Yeah, I guess I'm, I, I have to understand this, what you're saying a bit better. Um, I mean, you could say, okay, there's this building, well, the one we're in now, which has in the front of it a certain tiling. I mean, that's, if you're going to explain that, I mean, that's very different from what mathematical physicists do. I mean, mm -hmm. they're just looking for general principles. Right, right. And the, as far as we're aware, <laughs> those general principles are not violated in in what's been going on in this building. However, that's not entirely what I would think, because what's going on in this building and so on is an um, implication of what's going on in people's heads. And this does have to do with consciousness. And what's going on in consciousness, in my view, is not yet part of current physics. So I'm trying to say that although we have very good theories about how things behave, bodies behave, and they're not good enough yet to tell us how the conscious human brain operates. So do you allow your imagination to wander into the domain of metaphysical speculation about that? I mean, because you're, you're, you're making a case. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was talking some, to some divinity scholars the other day, and they were laughing, I suppose, about physicists who say, with regard to the Big Bang and the hypothetical emergence of everything out of nothing, that give us one free miracle and we'll proceed from there. And so, I mean, there is speculation among physicists that the laws of physics don't apply to whatever the state of existence was before the emer universe emerged into being. And you're making a case now as well that consciousness itself may not be able to be encapsulated within the realm of our current physical theories. It's, so what do you think the metaphysical, or yeah, do you, or... Let, let me try and get this, I'd have to unpack something here, because yeah. this is, we're venturing on a different topic here, Yes, I know. I which know. is the Sorry question of the Big that. Bang, Yes, which I have a different view on that from what you normally hear. Okay. So, but that's... Well, that'd be fun to start with that. We can talk about that, that if you want to. Yeah. That's an interesting topic to talk about, but that's really different, and as far as I, I don't even see a connection as things stand, from what I'm worrying about in consciousness. But I was what just I'm thinking they about, both stand outside the laws of known physics yes, in some but, sense. But let That's me say thing. something else which outside the laws of known physics. And th this is not something that people normally even recognize as a problem. I mean, they do, but they shove it under the carpet, which is what's known as the collapse of the wave function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, current quantum mechanics, strictly speaking, is an inconsistent theory. That's a rather a brutal way of saying what Einstein and Schrodinger and even Dirac said that quantum mechanics is incomplete. And the way to explain this is, okay, there's a wonderful equation which tells you how things say, a state evolves in quantum mechanics called the Schrodinger equation. Now, the Schrodinger equation tells you if you know what the state of a system is now, the Schrodinger equation tells you what it will be tomorrow, if you like. The evolution of that state is governed by this wonderful equation due to Erwin Schrodinger. The trouble is that it doesn't. That is to say, 
the way physicists usually use the Schrodinger equation is to work out certain probabilities of what an observation on the system would tell you. So what you have to do is you wheel out of the cupboard a, a measuring device. And this measuring device, you set it on the, the system, which is evolving according to the Schrodinger equation, and it measures it. And the process of measurement does not follow the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. right. It gives you a probabilistic answer, this or this or this. So that's another outside the system problem. Well, it's, it's certainly outside the Schrodinger equation. Right, right, right. And Schrodinger was terribly worried about this. I mean, he produced his cat in the box and all sorts of things. You see, he clearly realized there was a problem, as did Einstein. There's no question about that. Some others didn't. Well, they took a different view. They said, look, we don't understand the theory well enough. And that's more that we're saying. Where Schrodinger was not saying that. He was saying we understand it well enough to see that that's not the way the world operates. When you make a measurement on the system, it does not follow the Schrodinger equation. And that's what people understand about quantum mechanics. But it's, it's a sort of vague set of rules about... It doesn't tell you what constitutes a measurement. Right. That's the trouble. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a big trouble, That's actually. the big trouble. Yeah, yeah. They say if you do a measurement, then it just becomes probability for what this or that or the other. But it doesn't say what kind of a device makes a measurement. Now, there's one school of thought, which has been going on way, from way back to the early days of quantum mechanics. Wigner, in particular, promoted this point of view, that it's a conscious being observing the system, mm -hmm. and that makes That's what the Wheeler believed, I believe. I think Wheeler might have believed. There were quite a lot of people believe that. I think von Neumann had a similar sort of view. I'm not quite so sure about his view, but certainly Wigner. And I talked to Wigner about this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. I got the feeling from Wigner, he wasn't quite as dogmatic he was made out to be on this issue. He just thought this was a possibility, I think. But anyway, that's, people often refer to it as the Wigner view, that it's a conscious being who makes a measurement. That's not my view. My view is that it's almost the opposite of that view, that there is an objective physical process which, which deviates from the Schrodinger equation, in which the state does collapse so that it becomes one or the other or the other with certain probabilities. And that this has to do with when gravity is brought into the picture. And there's reasons for believing this. I don't want to go into that. But there is reason I'd, for I'd seeing... Like, I'd like you to go into it, if you would be willing to. Because, I'm, I mean, I'm very... Well, it's a, it's a very clear mathematical calculation. There's, there's not a question about it. It's a question of what you do with it, you see. <laughs> and what you do with it, according to me, is to say, okay, it tells you that this system has a lifetime, and, and it will, in that lifetime, become one or the other. Without a measurement? It sort of... That's right, yes. Without a, well, it's so interesting that's, to yes, me that, right. that you're interested in consciousness, and you see the, that consciousness in this Goodell theorem sort of manner, and I would think the most predictable thing for you to believe as a consequence of that would be that it is conscious measurement that collapses the, 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 the quantum indeterminacy, the waveform, and yet you don't. You think that, that, it, that, that statistical vagueness will collapse into something that's essentially, is it either or, is it binary? Well, is it zero, one, the collapse? No. You mean prob no, no, there's a probability it'll do one. Right, or the other. Yeah. right. But, but the, when the probability collapses, I mean. Well, if it's a two state system, you see, you might have an object which is in a superposition of here and here. Yeah. It was Dirac's first lecture, I remember hearing that. And he took out his piece of chalk and said, well. And he was talking about atoms, you see. According to quantum mechanics, or a particle, so a quantum particle can be here, or it can be here. Or it can be in a state which is partly here and partly here right, at the same right, time. Right. And then he took out a piece of chalk. And people tell me he used to break it in two. I can't quite remember. Because my mind was drifting away from what he was saying. And I was looking out of the window and thinking about something completely different. And unfortunately, it only came back after he'd gone on to the next topic. So I missed the explanation, which was probably a good thing, as I think back on it. Because... Probably the explanation was something sort of to calm you down and stop worrying about the problem. I suspect it was something like that. So you don't think that conscious, a conscious observer per se is necessary to collapse the waveform? Absolutely. That is what I 
don't, I mean, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. I don't believe that, yes. But you do think that, if I'm not mis mistaken, that the presence of, a of an observer in the universe, that is to say, that, or the observation of the universe by us, is that true to say is fundamental to the universe? Not really. That's, a, that's an interesting question, but it's not part of my view. The world would be there quite independently of whether there were creatures yes, of yes, consciousness yes, yes. walking around on them. Yes. It, so, so can I ask you a question about that? <laughs> so <laughs> it's related to this. So it's my understanding, mm. and I could be wrong about this too, because I'm way afield here, you know, I'm out of my depth and area of specialization, but my understanding is that in some sense, as far as a photon is concerned, mm -hmm that the universe is two-dimensional, perpendicular to its direction of travel. Mm, I don't see that, no, but go on. Well, I, I thought, and I thought, I thought that this, my, it's a consequence of con the contraction of, of things as the speed of light is approached. And so... Oh, I see. No, 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 that's, that's... Um, you're talking about the, the Lorentz contraction or whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, and I, no, I, no. I thought as part of that, that the that part of the reason that no amount of energy can propel something past the speed of light is because in some sense, the light beam is already where it is and at its destination at the same time, and you can't get flatter than flat. Now, the, the reason I asked you that, though, was because it, it pertained to this other question, which right. was, mm. it, if you could imagine what a, the universe might be like phenomenally from the perspective of a light photon, mm -hmm. that's very unlike the universe that we perceive. Oh, I see. I mean, if you, if you were riding on a... Well, I mean, Einstein used to talk Yes, about I know. Well, riding on a, on a light. The trouble is that um, you, you can't sit on a light. <laughs> yes, that is a problem. But if you, do, if you were nearly going, you know, yeah, very, very fast like that, the passage of time you would think it hadn't taken any time at all. Right, except, well, and, 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 and that's the same as being at the starting point and the destination. If at you the like, same, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, okay, yes. So, okay. Okay, so that, it, now, for us, we perceive things with duration and distance. And so, but the photon is in the universe, and we're in the universe, but the universe looks very unlike each of those situational positions. And so you said that there would be a reality independent of consciousness, but I'm curious, when you think of a reality independent of consciousness, what, what are the attributes of that reality? Like, is it, is it a field of quantum potential? Is it... Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but, but... I mean, classically, there's no problem. I mean, this thing about the contraction and all that stuff, with us going close to the speed of light and so on, this is classical physics, so we're not worrying really about the problems of quantum mechanics there. But they're already there in classical physics. But if you had a particle traveling at the speed of light, let's say just less than the speed of light, and if you could sit on that particle, it would seem as though you got to your destination almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with quantum Well, not directly to do with right, quantum right, mechanics. Right, right, right. That's just, that's relativity. Yes. Right. Yes, sure. But okay. the... the the phenomenal universe at that speed is radically different than the phenomenal universe at our speed. Yeah, but and the universe so, is there. It's just a question of... I'm not quite sure I understand this. You see... Well, I'm, tr the, the universe... I'm trying to understand how it can be all of those things simultaneously. Like, no, it's, it's, it's and what that means. That's not a problem. It's just, yeah. When I say it's not a problem, what I mean is that there is a way of looking at Relativity, which means special, and general relativity, which is completely coherent and doesn't really worry about who measures what. It's just there. You have a space-time, which is mm -hmm. this four-dimensional structure. Maybe hard to understand and visualize and so on, sure. But it's the thing which is there. People call it a block universe view. Well, I think about it as a whole symphony at once in some sense. Well, if you like. But it's, it's all there. And what something measures in that system, you have to go and ask the question. If you had a body traveling with a great speed and there was a clock on that body, you'd ask for how many ticks does it happen yes. before one end and the other. That's perfectly well defined. If it was sitting stationary 
you would have so many ticks between starting and finishing. You could have one which goes out and comes back. You might say there are only, only about four ticks, whereas this one had, had a thousand ticks. Well, that's the answer. It doesn't right, mean the time just, is, so it's susceptible to all those interpretations simultaneously. Yeah, because each one is just its only measuring it. With, it, has, it carries the clock with it, and that clock ticks at a certain rate, and that's fine. There's no problem. When I say there's no problem, I mean it's not a philosophical problem. There's a little bit of a problem of getting used to the ideas, sure. No, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. But that's not the issue. You can, once you've got used to the ideas, and you, oh, yes, you can see time is something which depends on how you're moving. Right. And the clock which is moving is there, fast. Is there any difference between that statement and rate of change depends on how fast you're moving? Like, is there any difference between time and rate of change? But rate of change is... Because I think of time as, as the average rate of change. And so when you say that time slows down as you move faster, you're not saying much more than as you move faster, you're the... That's just a question. You see, the, I think the mistake here is to think of time as, a, as a, an objective thing. Yes. Which is attached to this model, and it's right. not. Right, There is no concept of when such an event happens. You say, you might say, well, is this event later than that event? Well, if they're what's called space-like separated, that is to say, you'd have to go faster than light to get from one to the other. It's a meaningless statement because there is no universal concept of time in this model. Right. It's just not there. I think, you see, that goes against what we normally feel about time. Yes. We think about time as progressing and somebody on the Andromeda galaxy... Well, we experience duration, so... Yes, but you see, what about when is now? I, I often use this, I think I use this example of two people crossing the street, and they're walking, just walking speed, crossing the street. And the question is, according to one of these people, there is a... Con, con, at the same time as they cross each other, there is an event on the, uh, the Andromeda galaxy where a space fleet is, has been launched and they're going to invade the Earth. According to the other one, the decision has not even been made yet as to whether they're going to invade the Earth or not. Now, this is only because you're trying to transfer your local notion of, of what you mean by time to the Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. And this depends on what frame you're using. So right. if you're using a one moving frame, it hasn't happened yet, and the other one, it has. You just have to get used to that idea that there is no universal notion of time ticking away. Independently. Which, independently. Of frame of reference. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, okay. So, can, can so we I, get used to can that Can I go idea, sideways one more time? Because okay, yeah, I'd sure. like to ask you, like I said, I've been wanting to talk to a theoretical physicist okay, for right. like forever. I'm really curious about black holes. <laughs> and so okay, I have yeah. this idea. So tell me what you think about this. So... Um, when a star collapses past the neutron stage into a singularity, is, and let's say there's multiple black holes, mm -hmm. are they all the same singularity? Oh, no. Okay, okay. Well, well, I mean, you can link up them somewhere, but no, we don't. Far from saying we don't know, I would say no, they're different singularities. Well, I, I was, I was I trying... I can close that statement and we don't really know what we're talking about here, but go on. Yes. Okay, well, well, I was, I, yeah. I thought about this partly, God, it was so long ago that I thought about this that I can hardly even remember what I thought, but I was trying to wrestle with the fact that you get this unbelievably intense, not even single point gravitational field, and there, there are strange effects of, there are strange effects of time inside the event horizon of a black hole from the perspective of an observer. Now, if I remember correctly, if you were watching someone descend into a black hole from outside, don't they go slower and slower? Yeah, you would, you would see them hovering on the horizon and then fading away very quickly, actually. Okay. They what, would just fade, yeah. They would fade. What, what, happens, what happens to their sense of time once they pass the event horizon compared to the sense of time, the framework? Well, they would go right through and they wouldn't notice anything at the horizon. Right, and what would that look? And you wouldn't be able That's to see them anymore. That's a very anymore. big black hole. Yeah, it's a little one. They, they would have been wrecked by the uh, tidal forces. But yeah, if it's a big enough black hole, you could imagine going through it. You wouldn't even know you'd gone through the horizon. If you could see someone descending into it, how long would it take them to arrive at the surface? Is that forever? 
Not for them, no. Just no, but for you watching them. Well, you just see them. You don't ever see inside the horizon. The light can't get out from right, inside the right, horizon. Right, right, right. So you never see that. That's right. So they could be watching their watches and thinking, whoops, we've gone through now. And they would do that. But you'd, if you could see their watch from outside, you'd see the, the, the hand slowing down and getting closer and closer to the moment when they cross the horizon. But fading out but, at the same But it would time. be slowing down. Yes. You'd see it slowing down, yes. Okay. Then, if you could see inside, would you see that continuing to slow? No. Uh, no. Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean well, by seeing inside. Once they pass the event horizon, you can't see them anymore. That's but right. as they approach the event horizon, if you were watching them, you'd see their clock slowing. Yes. So if, if you were outside. If yes. you were outside. Yeah. So then I'm wondering, you can't tell this, but their clock is going to slow the same way as they continue moving to, towards the black hole. And, and see, then that's the, the trouble, you see, it's the wrong way to think of it. Okay. Is, is that their clock is, is there a time which their clock registers. That's going to saying there is a universal time, which everybody right. is supposed to respect in some sense. Relativity says no. There is no notion well, of But I'm assuming their, their, their clock would continue to slow relative to you. I'm, I'm not trying to assume an, an absolute time in the question. I'm just, I'm wondering is that as they approach, I know, I know, the problem that you can't detect it is the problem here, but as they're moving towards the star relevant, relative to someone who's watching them, their clocks are slowing. According to... This frame of reference. Signals that you would receive, maybe that clock, it, it emits a little flash of light. Yeah, every second, yes, that, like that, exactly. And you see, look, those flashes light are slowing down and... Getting farther apart. Yes, that's right. Okay, so then, from the external perspective, I was thinking that it would take them forever to reach the singularity. And if it takes forever, then that would be the same amount of time that it would take everything in the universe to collapse back into the initial singularity if the collapsing universe theory is correct. And so the reason there's infinite gravitation in some sense at the point of the singularity is because that's a point at which the end of the universe is already manifest in the current universe. And that seems to me that that would be what would you say, in keeping with the idea in some sense of a block universe? I'm not quite sure I see the problem here. You're thinking about the whole universe, a collapsing model. Yes. Which you could certainly yes. have. Yes, and I, I'm also wondering if that's a model that you, you think is... No, it's not my model. It's but not. It's certainly okay. a model that people can consider, sure. And you might have a, a, an entire universe which is collapsing inwards, yes. And then you would hit the singularity before you see somebody else hitting it. In those models, you, you, would, you would find uh, you're in trouble and that your curvature is getting too big and you'd get, be killed by it. As you were watching somebody else and you see, no, 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 they're happily not nearly there yet. Right, not nearly there yet. So yes. that's what oh, you would, yeah, okay. that would say. That is yes, what you, yes. okay, okay, yeah, that's yeah. okay, okay. All right, then your model isn't, uh, is it a Big Bang model with an initial emergence out of nothing, and then eventually a collapse back to that? No. No. So, no. okay, so how do you conceptualize that? Well, first of all, it is a Big Bang model. In other words, there is a Big Bang, but the Big Bang was not the beginning. The model, the reason people have trouble with this model, I think, is you're probably going to have trouble with it, and you're not unique in this. Um, you see, people tend to think that if you have a model in which it keeps on going in some sense, and your Big Bang is not the beginning, that you've got to collapse back. So it expands mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, then it comes back mm -hmm. and then you're back with... But this it seems model simpler is, that way. Yes, but this model is not like that. And that's where you've got to get your mind around okay. it. Okay. And it's, people have trouble, and I agree with it. It's, it is a crazy idea, and I admit it's a crazy idea. The trouble is it seems it's quite likely it's true from certain okay. observational okay. things. But it's crazy, too. It can be crazy and true at the same time. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's like a definition of life. <laughs> yes. But you see, in this model, the universe expands, and it expands, and this exponential expansion we seem to see, the stars seem to be going, starting to go away from us, these very distant stars that people look at, with an increasing speed. Right, and right. And it seems to be this exponential expansion. Mm -hmm. 
And that's I what's driven the dark energy hypothesis, I that's presume. That's what they call it's really, Einstein. well, I, I claim it's just absolutely nothing inconsistent with Einstein's 1917, was it? In modification, if you see, that he regards his biggest mistake, but he's probably actually right. Mm -hmm. That's to say the introduction of a cosmological constant. constant. Right, right. Yeah. He introduced it for the wrong reason, that's true. But he was right to introduce it, even though he regarded his, <laughs> his biggest mistake. Right. Well, he there. needed it to make things work, but he didn't have any real practical reason for assuming that it was true, apart from... He wanted a ecstatic universe. He didn't like the expansion. No, the, he, he mm. didn't. No, this was at a time before. I think Hubble had already seen the expansion, but it hadn't mm. quite got through to Einstein how convincing these results were. So he wanted the universe was just static and stayed there forever. Right, right. And then he needed the cosmological constant to do that. That's correct. He would need that. However, he was wrong. To th when he got convinced, oh no, the universe is expanding. Sorry, he, mm -hmm. said, he said, oh, well, that was a mistake. My biggest blunder. He said. The trouble is, his biggest mother turned out to be true. It's apparently. I mean, this is an argument. People don't necessarily think it was. People might not think it's the cosmological constant. I think it was. I think it's right. I have reason, you know, internal reasons for that. But let's say um, that this is right. It's a cosmological constant. The universe expands and expands exponential expansion. Now, you might ask, who's in this universe eventually? Not us. The black holes will all have evaporated away by Hawking evaporation. They've swallowed galactic clusters. What's left in the universe? Pretty well photons. Now, I'm giving you the simplified version okay. of the theory because okay. you, there's some questions about it still. But let's say it's dominated by photons, which is pretty, pretty well true, but not. let's take that. Okay. Now, the trouble with photons is that they don't feel the passage of time. Right. And more importantly, the equations governing light are the wonderful equations due to James Clerk Maxwell, the Maxwell equations. And the Maxwell equations have a very interesting property, that they can't tell big from small. They're what's called conformally invariant. That if you have a system in which you've got some electromagnetic field, and you could stretch this system to bigger or smaller, it doesn't notice the difference. The equations right. work just as well. And you can squash them here and stretch them here. Well, in, is that in part because space really doesn't mean anything to a photon? In a sense. Well, it's the scale of space. You see, it's what we call... There's a term which I'll use here. It's called conformal. Conformal means big and small. I very much like... You, we talked about Escher a minute ago. There are these Escher pictures called circle limits, where he describes what's called hyperbolic geometry, but don't worry about that. The most famous one is these angels and devils. And you see right. that there's a circular boundary, and they look as though they get smaller and smaller and smaller as they get to the edge. Yes. Now, as far as those angels and devils are concerned, the little ones are just the same as the big ones. Right. They don't know that they're smaller towards the edge. And that, to them, is an infinite universe. But to us, we can see, no, there's this infinity which is just sitting there. And these angels and devils, if they don't know big from small, I'm not sure I have a bit of trouble using this to explain things because they, the angels and devils do have a size in the picture. But you see, if they were made of massless material, that wouldn't know big from small. So if they were made of just electromagnetism, then big and small are equivalent. And so you wouldn't know when you got to the edge of this universe. So that infinity is just like anywhere else. That's the difficult concept in this thing, that the photons reach infinity without realizing, without realizing anything funny has happened, if you put it like that. Infinity in this conformal picture is just like anywhere else. It's only mass that knows the difference. If you want to build a clock, you need mass. And the, the, this comes from the, the two most famous equations of 20th century physics. And the two most famous equations, one of them is Einstein's E equals mc squared, of course, which tells us that energy and mass are equivalent. And the earlier one was, it was um, Max Planck's 
E equals H nu, or E equals HF, whatever I should call the frequency, which tells you that energy and frequency are equivalent. Put the two together, that tells you mass and frequency are equivalent. So that means that if you have a mass, it is a clock. It has a frequency simply determined by its mass. And this fact is really the basis of modern clocks, which are extraordinarily precise. They don't directly give this because the frequency is much too high. You have to scale it down. But roughly, it's the same idea. So a clock, a mass is a clock. But the other side of that coin is if you don't have any mass, you don't have any clocks. So you don't have any time? You don't have any time scale. You mm -hmm. don't have any distance measure. So if the world is inhabited only by massless things, say photons, then it doesn't know big from small. It doesn't know hot from cold. And so the idea is, and this is where you have to take a deep breath. <laughs> the idea yeah, is, as opposed to all the other parts of this conversation. <laughs> yes. The idea is that the remote future is indistinguishable from a Big Bang, so long as there is no mass around. Now, the remote future, the reason you have no mass around is basically, well, the, listen, there's a complicated part of the argument. Yeah. But let's say it's because there's mainly photons. That's good enough. What about the other end? What about the Big Bang? Well, there's yeah. lots of mass there, surely. But the thing is that at the Big Bang, things get so hot, things are moving around so fast, if you like, that the energy or the mass energy, mass hyphen energy, the concept of mass, according to Einstein, is almost entirely in their motion. And that the mass becomes more and more irrelevant the closer you get to the Big Bang. So again, you have a situation where mass is effectively zero. And so it, are, are you, are you, is it your claim, belief, theory, that when things ground out in a universe that only consists of electromagnetic radiation, that that is now a precondition for an event like the Big Bang? In a sense, yes. I'm saying that the physics which is going on at the very remote future is extraordinarily like the physics going on at the very beginning. I'm... I'm going to end of the, there. When I say beginning, I only mean the Big Bang, because it's not really the beginning. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's such a lovely place to end, and we have been going for an hour and a half, and I don't want to wear you to a frazzle. I'm not frazzled. Well, <laughs> I, I think I might be. Would you, would you mind so, if I just asked a couple sure, of questions? Sure, go, go ahead, Jordan. Stephen, um, please. One of the things that I'm um, very struck by in your account of the three realms of of matter, m mind, and mathematics, mm. roughly speaking, is that, is that the realm of mind or consciousness is, they're not, the realms are not reducible one to another. So the realm of, of mind cannot be reduced simply to the realm of matter, nor can the realm of mathematics be reduced simply to uh, the realm of matter. They each have their own existence. Well, you see, it's, it's a picture which I've used. I'm not sure whether it completely concurs with my current views, but go on with what well, you're what, saying. What, I'm, what, I, what I wanted to ask you about is, and it's a two-part question, but I'll start with the, the first here, and that is that what is the relationship? It appears as though there's a fundamental intrinsic relationship between the realm of our consciousness, our thinking, mm -hmm. on the one hand, and the, the realm of mathematics, or let's say intelligible reality. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, I'd like to hear you comment on, I mean, just to, to maybe see this a little bit, you know, the philosopher Plato, as you well know, and you often de describe this realm of mathematics as a platonic realm, it had a theory of, of recollection, and we can regard that as a myth or whatever, but it does appear at some very profound level that it's true that, that we, we come to, we couldn't come to understand things that have an intelligible reality, like mathematics, if they were not already somehow in us or potentially in us in the patterns or structures of our own conscious consciousness. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if you could say a few words about the, the relationship between our thinking or the realization of our thinking, its development, and uh, the realm of the mathematical, or more broadly speaking, you might call it intelligible reality, or however, however you might want to construe that, that realm. 
Are we talking about the perception of mathematics? Or, or I think is that's, yeah, well, that's let's the start with that. Yes, the sure. possibility yes. of understanding. Mathematics? Yes, the possibility yes, yeah. of understanding mathematics. Gosh. So what? I, I, actually, I've lost the thread of the question. The oh, question so really, was, the question sorry, is: What it, it, do you believe there is? Is there an intrinsic relationship? There appears to be between our thinking, our the realm of uh, consciousness, and the realm of mathematics or intelligible reality, independent of us, but intrinsically related. Are those realms in, intrinsically related? Well, I think I'm trying to say that we can access the truths of mathematics with our consciousness. How we do that, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but somehow we can access that world. And of course, some people find it easier than others, and this is a, a difficulty in trying to talk about these things. It's a question for Richard the Dawkins later in the day. <laughs> yes, and at, and at the, the risk of going, uh, going out too far, uh, I, I want to just make it an effort at, at relating this question to, to, the, to, the, to the work of, of Dr. Dr. Peterson, one of the things that um, Dr. Peterson has clearly sh shown is that there are many, many people who are not, it's called the, for some people, or as a shorthand, we call this the meaning crisis. Many, many people who are finding they don't, they simply don't have the, the, the resources to make sense of their lives in a way that seems to be adequate to the demands of their own self-consciousness. And so, you know, at, at the heart of human life, as, as evolved, as creatures that are evolved as self-conscious, is, is clearly finding a way of understanding ourselves in the world that is adequate to the demands of that very self-consciousness. And, and life has no, the, what life is as meaningful is precisely to, to answer that demand of ourselves as a self-conscious creature. And um, one of the things that it seems to me that very much that, uh, is at work at this, at least some profound level, is, that, is the idea that, that everything is reducible simply to materiality. That, as it were, eliminates any substantial reality to our own consciousness. If that were true, it would just be an epiphenomenon. Um, but it also d denies the existence of, of an independent realm of spirit, as some philosophers would say, or of intelligible reality, or simply put it in, the, in terms of the mathematical. And so what I'm, what I'm wondering about, and it's maybe an outrageous question to ask a physicist, but you have written many and many beautiful books that are clearly related very much to this very question um, that has to do with the nature of, 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 of human realization, that is to say, how we come to understand ourselves um, in, 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 the, in, in, in the world. And what I'm, what I'm trying to drive to here is, is whether you have thoughts on the nature of the realization of our consciousness, we could call that simply human realization as a shorthand, and about the... It's a question like what might constitute the fact of intelligibility, right? There's a, there's a capacity for us to, to reflect this structure that the mathematical structure, the physical structure, we, and, and that seems to be part of what you described as understanding. It's like I, perhaps you're um, formulating a question about the metaphysics of that intelligibility. Yes, or we could simply say, Sir Roger, in your observation and, and uh, reflection, uh, what are the forms of, of, of life and culture that appear to facilitate that deep human realization that appears to have an intrinsic relationship between our selves as self-conscious creatures and the nature of what is independent of us? And that does seem to be, to be at the heart of the question of meaning that Dr. Peterson has, has been working on and perhaps helped others to think about. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure I've grasped the question here, but it has to do with people's, I mean, this relationship between conscious beings and this, this world of mathematical, platonic world, if you like. Yes. And it's certainly something which people differ very much in how easily they mm -hmm. make that contact, if you like. And I, I certainly have made attempts to try and explain to people who are not used to thinking about mathematics, if you like, to, to, to gain a little bit in that understanding of what's going on in mathematics. So that's, that's how successful or not, I don't know, but well, it's at least it, an attempt to Well, uh, thank you. And as, yes. as a follow-up to that question, do you intuit or, or think or uh, believe that, that in that realm of 
the mathematics as you might say intelligible reality do you think other things might also be included in that let's say um, uh, truth generally or love or or beauty uh, are because of course the dominant view right now is that these are simply constructs of the human mind or culture or it's another way of saying the human mind or material forces that are at work that have given rise to these constructs but don't actually have any independent reality themselves do you think that there is a, a kinship or perhaps that mathematical reality or truth is part of a realm that that exists as independently as mathematics do i think that there's an I believe I have in some places, I'd have to think where it is, adorned this picture with the, the Platonic world being part of a bigger picture, mm -hmm. which has to do with other things than... You see, that's to do with truth, if you like. Mm. But there's a question of beauty or other right. qualities. And I think that may be relating to the question you're mm. raising here. I don't have much to say about it, but I do, I, I do remember drawing a picture somewhere, I can't even remember where now, in which this Platonic world was part of a larger body of things like beauty, for example, and qualities, or virtue, in fact, also, things, qualities mm. which are things that our consciousness is concerned with and very important. But not quite what I've been talking about, which is a yes. very specific thing, yes, which is I understand. understanding mathematical truth. Yes. So I certainly would agree that it's, there's more to it than that. And I think that's what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm going along with that. It's just that I didn't know what to do with it, I think. That's, that's the trouble. Yes. Well, I, the reason I, I ask is because it, it, it does seem to me that if these two things are connected, that is to say that the, the nature of what we are and think that we are mm -hmm. is somehow intrinsically, according to its own let's say, structure or yeah, nature yeah. Uh, connected. I mean, we might even say, I mean, if human beings don't have no, no nature, there's sometimes which mathematics itself is not even possible. I mean, certainly not for us. I mean, it seems to be we have to, we have an innate capacity uh, to varying degrees, as you say, to think these thoughts or, or perceive these realities. But if that realm is, say the realm of mathematics is part of a larger realm in the way that you've just, uh, just said, and it is related intrinsically to, to what we are, that our self-perception and self-consciousness has a structure such that it, it calls out for, in some sense, an understanding of these things or an understanding of ourselves in relation to those, 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 those realities. It does seem to me that human realization has to be thought very fundamentally through from that starting point. Yeah, well, I think... All I can say here is that I have considered that in places. I c could probably find a transparency that I used to use for talks. Whether I can find a place in something I've written, I'm not so sure. But I certainly did consider the Platonic you know, truth, if you like. It was really more like truth, beauty, and morality. In, in, that, in that order? That's a good question. I think if I could find what I, mm -hmm. whether there was an order. And, and what I think would there you, was an order, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. what mm. would... And, when you say morality in that sense, I mean, truth and beauty, in some sense, that's more apprehensible than, than morality. Do you have any idea why your intuition drove you to place morality at the, at, at the outermost part of that I particular diagram? I can't remember whether even I did or not. Okay. So that, that, that I'd have to <laughs> rake through all the things I'd... I, I suspect there must be an article somewhere where I did that, but I do remember using it in talks, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so this would be addressing the remark you made. It's, it's more that I don't really have anything that I can say. I can say, okay, I like things. I like Bach, for instance. <laughs> very fond of that, very much. And that certain, certain, I think particularly with music, there are things which, which I can relate to very much. But in order to make it anything that I can talk in a rational way about, I sort of I give up there because I'm not good enough at Right. Arguing about right, these things. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, I guess so we're doing we do this that way. <laughs> it was, I'm so happy that you agreed to talk to me. Well, I hope it was, was of some use to you, yes. But um, some of these things I think are, that's are difficult to, to describe, and uh, clearly it's, it's particularly these things with the, with the Big Bang and all that, which is an idea which we do seem to see evidence for something, signals, you see, there could be signals coming through from the previous eon, as I call it, 
And I think we see them. The colleagues of mine... You'd have to throw that in at the end, <laughs> wouldn't you? Well... What do you mean? Oh, well, they, yeah, they've been... You see, I used to go around giving talks about this stuff very often. I thought, this is fine, I can do this. Nobody will ever know whether I'm wrong or not, and so I can talk about this forever. <laughs> and then I thought, I wonder if that's right. And I thought, well, first thing I thought about was collisions between supermassive black holes. I mean, our galaxy is in a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. It has a black hole much bigger than ours. After we collide and set things settle down a bit, our, our poor little black hole will be gulped down by it. And there will be enormous gravitational waves going out, carrying away some proportion of the, significant proportion of the mass energy in, in the two objects being concerned here. And maybe they could be detected by different people. Maybe they could be detected in the next eon. Gravitational waves can get through from one to the next. And this is clearly, according to the model, they can. So various people try to search for these things, mainly my colleague Vahe Gurzajan, who is an Armenian, and some other Polish people who later get on on it. And they had a much clearer calculation of what they regarded as the probability that these signals were really there. A 99.4% confidence level, I think they got. That they are? Yes, that they're there. Some people didn't believe us because they don't believe the model, of course. But then more importantly, more recently, and this is a paper, mainly one which came out in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society oh, about a year and a half ago. And we claim that we see what we call hawking points. That would be after one of these galactic clusters gets swallowed up by a black hole and there's nothing left but this black hole, it evaporates away by Hawking evaporation. Mm -hmm. All that radiation doesn't even begin until so late that by the time it comes into the next eon, it's a little tiny point. That little tiny point over 380,000 years spreads out. There's a little bit of an argument about how far it spreads out, but what we seem to see is it spreads out to about four degrees cross, which is about eight times the diameter of the full moon. And that's what we see. So we see with a now bigger confidence level, 99.98. There is an argument now which is to do with whether the actual size we see is consistent with expectations. And there's interesting questions about that. But ignoring that point, we have a 99.98% confidence level that they're there, the spots, there's little spots of raised temperature, and we see them. Hmm. And why are they there? What are they doing there? According to current theory, they shouldn't be there. According to the theme I put forward, yes, they should be there. And they're the result of the remote future of a galactic cluster. Prop propagating itself into the next eon. The radiation, the yes, yes, it's the radiation, the Hawking radiation, probably, which mm -hmm. comes from the black hole, and all this mass gets concentrated into that ray, and that comes through a little tiny point, which by the time you see it, is spread out to about eight times the diameter of the moon. And we see these spots, and they're seen, they're seen both in the more sophisticated Planck satellite data, and if you look at the, what is it now, the five strongest points in the Planck data, and look in the earlier W map, that's a different satellite, completely different, and you find these spots exactly the same places in the W map data. There's a sixth one in the W map data, which is just about as strong as those five. Look back in the Planck data, and that's there too. So those six points, I claim, are genuine Hawking points, as I'm calling them. And there's no other explanation for them that I know of. They're seen and they are independently confirmed by another group who were claiming they don't see anything, but they do see the they see evidence for these spots too. You just look at the data. Okay. What's the reason for it? Any current current cosmology, I can't see any explanation for them. This model predicts them. I haven't seen any response from the, after a year and a half from the 
established cosmology community, published in a very respectable journal, it's probably the leading journal for astrophysical processes. There is an error but in, in this, which is rather curious, but I don't want to go into that. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, much, whether the confidence level may, should be reduced a bit, I think that's probably a case for that, but not much because the signal is pretty strong. Thank you very much. That was, a, that was something, man. Well, just to bring us to a close here, Sir Roger, it's been a great honor to speak with you today, I know, for both me and Dr. Peterson. Thank you so very much for your time. It's been my pleasure.